So um, the Scottish Celtic Revival, as you all know, took the form of a romantic reconstruction of the past. And in the artistic sphere, it represented an attempt to regain contact with the nation's primitive cultural roots to emulate a bygone age, albeit viewed through a contemporary lens. It drew on the discoveries of archeologists and antiquarians, and it was driven by a demand for authenticity, often underpinned by different ideological agendas. In Edinburgh, the revival was spearheaded by the biologist and utopian visionary Patrick Geddes that we've already heard about in previous uh, talks. And it was he who voiced the principal beliefs of the movement through his publication, The Evergreen. The cover, the cover, which was designed by Charles Hodge Mackey, was emblazoned with a Celtic tree of life, and the journal included translations of Breton and Irish legends, and the poetry and writings of Fiona MacLeod, the female alter ego of the publication's editor, William Sharp. Among the many contributors was the artist John Duncan, who produced some of the key images of the Scottish Celtic revival. And it's my aim in this paper to create a context for a deeper understanding of Duncan's Celtic revival works. Now, Duncan was art editor of the Ed Evergreen, and um, the aims of the journal were blatantly propagandist from the outset, designed to promote Celticism as progressive, health-giving, regenerative, and anti-decadent. And as Robert Nich Robin Nicholson has argued, the journal was established in opposition to the decadent London-based Yellow Book, which included illustrations by Aubrey Beardsley. Everything about the design of the evergreen was by contrast inspired by supposedly purer northern and specifically Celtic sources. The first volume was illustrated with head and tail pieces that drew on Celtic designs inspired by insular manuscripts such as the Book of Kells. The opening essay or proem by W. MacDonald and J. Arthur Thompson demanded a return to the purity of nature from urban to rural, from fever to fresh air. The principal aim, voiced by Geddes, was to promote cultural revival and social evolution, and the four editions of the journal included essays by biologists, theologians and geographers, including the anarchist Elise, Elise Reclus, as well as con contributions by artists, poets and folklorists. On the face of it, therefore, the Evergreen was a profoundly Celtic publication overseen by Sharp and Duncan, two ardent revivalists. And Duncan took a scholarly and even archaeological interest in Celtic art. However, I'd like to argue in this paper that Duncan's particular brand of Celticism was also underpinned by contemporary debates around race and national identity. Indeed, the idea of Celticism as representing a new and somehow purer form of cultural identity is strongly suggested in the Evergreen's introduction. This notion of the Celts as somehow untainted, better than their neighbours, finds its origin in texts such as Ernest Renan's Poésie des races Celtiques, to which I'll return later. Geddes saw the benefits of creating a healthy, creative and stimulating environment for the encouragement of a national cultural revival. However, he was also at pains to emphasize that the Celtic rena renaissance, although on the surface motivated by a strongly nationalist agenda, shared in what he termed, quote, a wider cultural movement, which knows neither nationality nor race. For Geddes, Scottish identity was embedded in a collective multi multifaceted Celtic identity and its roots were to be found, quote, in the wild of dreamlands of Galway and Cader Idris, of Man and Aaron and Galloway. Geddes may have avoided the term race, <clears throat> but he was influenced nonetheless by the sociological beliefs of the French writer Hippolyte Ten, and in particular by his notion that the work of art is a product of race, milieu et moment. By race or race, Ten meant an inherited national disposition or temperament. By milieu, he was referencing the immediate physical and socio-political environment in which the work of art was created. And by moment, he suggested something along the lines of zeitgeist, and sometimes even the way in which past and present cultural traditions interact. And Geddes refers indirectly to Ten in his 1895 essay on the Celtic Renaissance when he writes, you can see it um, in bold here, all organic beginnings to survive and grow need fit time and even more than fortunate place. However, he's very careful to omit any reference to race. Now, before we're moving on to Duncan, I'd like to spend a few minutes looking more closely at this problematic term, race. Um, for a concept of a Celtic race was hotly debated in the mid to late 19th century. The Celtic tribes were identified initially on the basis of different language use indicated by the map on the right. The Irish and Scots spoke Gaelic or Gaelic, 
The second Celtic group spoke Brythonic or Cymric, and the rest of Britain was inhabited by the Anglo-Saxons. Of course, in the seventh century, as this map on the left demonstrates, Scotland, Wales, and England, as we know them, did not yet exist. Borders were eternally shifting, and the transition from a Roman-style administrative system to the Celtic kingdom was only gradual. Celtic identity was something constantly fluid and, and shifting. By contrast, 19th century, or the, by the 19th century, the characterization of the Celts was much more polarized and, and thoroughly prejudiced. The Celts were treated as one race and were often compared, usually unfavorably, to their southern neighbors, the Teutons. A religious difference, as much as racial prejudice, complicated the issue and led British historians to cast the Celts in a dubious light. The Celtic, predominantly Catholic highlands of Scotland were often con contrasted unfavorably with the Teutonic Protestant lowlands. Antiquarians such as John Pinkerton went so far as to observe that, quote, Scotland was held back by its degenerate Celtic population. While in The Origin of Aryans, published in 1889, the Reverend Isaac Taylor asserted that the lowland Scot was intellectually superior to his northern neighbor, being more purely Teutonic than the English. Occasionally, the Celts were portrayed as instinctive and creative, but, but also as feckless, irrational, and ill-tempered, as opposed to the more rational and disciplined Teutons. In 1870, the Scottish historian John Hill Burton assessed that the Teutonic or Germanic races were more noble, rational, and in every way superior to their Celtic neighbors. In his seven volume History of Scotland, Hill Burton described the Celts as a de degenerate race, lazy and improvident, and associated with pagan rather than Christian practices. And since the fusion of the pagan and the Celtic is the theme of much of John Duncan's work, I would suggest that he was that he deeply resented such views. In 1870, Thomas Huxley published several articles in Nature and the Pall Mall Gazette objecting to the narrow and bigoted attitudes towards the Celtic race that were then prevalent. As Huxley and others pointed out, such divisiveness was too simplistic and limiting since parts of England and lowland Scotland, the so-called Teutonic areas, were colonized by Celtic tribes. In an article published in Nature, Huxley discussed the physical appearance of the British, which uh, he divided into two types. Again, very, quite a narrow definition. He, and he wrote as follows, the one type is tall, fair complexioned, yellow or red haired and blue eyed. The other short, dark complexioned, black haired and black eyed. The two types and their intermediate gradations are at present to be found side by side in most parts of the British islands. There is a marked predominance of the fair type in the Eastern half of Britain, that's the Saxon part. The languages spoken by the English people have at the present time no relation to these two physical types. English speakers and Celtic speakers belonging no less to the one type than to the other, nor are the two Celtic dialects, Cymric and Gallic, confined to people of the one or the other physical type, as both the types described are exhibited in their extreme forms among Welshmen, Highlanders and Irishmen. So he's really at pains to, um, to kind of emphasise that it's, it was really not as simple as, as these historians were making out. Now, Matthew Arnold, later in the century, um, in his study, of Celtic literature, which was published in 1891, did much to redefine the Celts as a sensitive and imaginative race. He maintained that there is no such original chasm between the Celt and the Saxon as we once popularly imagined, that they are not truly what Lord Lindhurst called them, aliens in blood from us, but that they are our brothers in the great Indo-European family. Arnold was strongly influenced by the French historian Ernest Renan, whose Poésie des races celtiques originally published in 1854, was translated into English in 1896. Renan originally emphasized the purity of the Celtic races. You can see from this quote, he was quite extreme in his views. He stressed the inviolability of their national character, which was, quote, free from all alien admixture. However, in his 1882 essay, What is a Nation? Also published in English in 1896, he modified his ideas concerned that the concept of a pure race should not be used to political ends. Renan believed that race should not be confused with nation, since a nation could be made up of different ethnic types. And he maintained that Britain was one of the more noble nations since it represented, quote, a mixture of Celtic and Teutonic blood, concluding as Arnold would do, that the greatest European nations are of mixed blood. 
19th century archaeologists added to the debate, however, demonstrating that the Celts themselves were in fact ethnically diverse, originating from different parts of Europe and Asia. Now, this idea is clearly reflected in one of the earliest images of the Scottish Celtic revival, George Henry and E.A. Hornell's The Druids, bringing in the mistletoe. In terms of Scottish identity, this richly coloured vision of an ancient druidical ceremony portrays three different ethnic Celtic types. Some are dark-haired and dark-skinned, possibly representing the Picts, who are said to be of Scythian origin, perhaps, I mean, emanating, that's from, from modern-day Iran. Others are red-haired and fair-skinned, representing the kingdom of Dalriada, colonised in the third or fourth centuries by the Scots, a warlike Celtic race with red hair and green eyes. This is obviously, this is taken from a, a 19th century source. A third type in the painting possibly represents the Britons or Bretons, of Strathclyde, another Celtic tribe who controlled the area from the River Clyde to the Solway Firth and beyond into Northern England. They were stocky, fair-skinned and dark-haired. Now, Henry and Hornell claimed to base some of their figures features on actual Druid skulls, but of course, as um, has been recently discovered, they used photographs of Native Americans as their source. Um, turning now to John Duncan, he too embraced the idea of a Scottish nation whose mythical roots were plural and multinational. His sources were eclectic and his paintings and drawings were informed by extensive reading of the Celtic myths, a knowledge of the Gallic language and a visual repertoire of Celtic imagery bordering on antiquarianism, as well as a fertile imagination. He had a large library and he read avidly in both English and French. His notebooks, which are now in the National Library of Scotland, list publications by Sir John Rees, Henri d'Arbois de Juvinville, Théodore Herson, Vicomte de la Villemarque, Daniel O'Sullivan, Albert Lee, Charles Squire, and also he lists the Celtic Review, Celtia, and the Revue Celtique. So he read um, in both French and English uh, fluently. One of Duncan's principal sources of Celtic myth was uh, d'Arbois de Juvinville's Cours de la littérature celtique, the first volume of which was published in 1882. In this ambitious 12-volume publication, Darbois de Jubainville discusses the heroes of Celtic myth, beginning with Cahoulan, Ulster's hero, who led the struggle against the, the rest of Ireland. The Jubainville dates Cahoulan's exploits to around the time of Christ and emphasizes the factual basis for these tales, even though the retellings of, of Cahoulan's exploits were, as the author himself admitted, and I'm quoting, largely creations emanating from the author's Im imaginations. And that in these cycles, it's often difficult to distinguish fact from fiction. In his paintings, Duncan too combined fact and fiction, archeological detail and invention. And among the first truly Celtic images that he produced were the series of murals commissioned by Geddes for the University Hall at Ramsey Lodge. Duncan depicted three Celtic heroes, Fingal or Fen, from James McPherson's Ossian saga, Cahoulin from the Ulster cycle, and the young King Arthur, whose origins can be found in Welsh folklore. The choice of images was consciously pan-Celtic, perhaps suggesting Geddes's influence again. King Arthur in this work is challenged by his Brythonic half-sister Morgan Le Fay, whose magic sim symbolically could be said to represent a threat to the historical and cultural continuity of the ancient Britons. Duncan portrays Arthur and his sister as different Celtic types. And it, the question really is, is this deliberate or was it just by chance? Um, she appears as the stockier, dark haired Briton, pale skinned. Um, and she's held very much in opposition to Arthur who is slim and red headed. In the next mural, uh, the, the difference is made even more overt. This shows the Irish or Scottish Finn or Fingal um, in combat with Swaran, son of Stano, king of Lochlin, um, which was the equivalent of modern day Norway. Finn is, is portrayed as red haired and fair skinned, a Celtic type again, whereas Stano is fair haired and dark skinned. Um, so again, it's the, 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 the difference, the ethnic difference between the two is made extremely overt. Now Duncan drew on Ossian for, for this work, but also for Anima Celtica, one of his best known works, which was published in the first edition of the Evergreen. And in this picture, the Celtic soul or imagination is visualized as a dark haired, pale skinned sorceress conjuring up images of heroes from Celtic mythology. The scenes in the top part of the picture exist in her imagination, 
or perhaps they've been summoned up through her psychic powers. The legends emerge from a curious incense burner, the smoke from which divides the various elements and then ends in a swirl of Celtic interlace. The images in this work address the themes of Renaissance and regeneration, a reflection of the Evergreen's aims. So we find the awakening of Cahulan, the birth of, of Ossian, and uh, bottom left, the swine of the Tour de Danan who continually renew themselves. However, Duncan also produced a painted version, which in some ways is, is more interesting and more obviously concerned with the, the plur plurality or the complexity of Celtic identity. It depicts on the top left, uh, top left, uh, Deirdre of the Sorrows, who was betrothed to the King of Ulster, but fell in love with a man from Erin, Ireland, with whom she fled to Scotland. And then we have Manon, the god of the sea, who gives his name to the Isle of Man. And on the right, the Irish children of Lear, who were transformed into swans during the pagan era and regained their human form 300 years later, once Christianity had been brought to Ireland. The complexity and the shifting nature of Celtic identity is also a theme of one of Duncan's greatest works, Tristan and Isolde. The painting, framed in gold interlace, was based on a Celtic legend, which tells the tale of a young Cornish or Breton prince, because it's told the same tale told in Brittany and in Cornwall, who travels to Ireland on behalf of his uncle, King Mark of Cornwall, to ask for the hand of Prince Isolde. During the return journey, the two drink a love potion that's been prepared by Isolde's mother for her daughter and King Mark. Thereafter, they are bound to each other in an adulterous love affair. The story prefigures the Arthurian love triangle of, of Arthur, Guinevere and Lancelot, and their union could be said to symbolise the triumph of youth and progress, or a threat to continuity in the status quo. It could be said to represent also the union of the Gael, symbolised by Isolde, with the Cornish, Welsh, Breton, Celt, embodied by Tristan, even if this union is troubled. Now, this is actually made quite overt. The difference between the two is made quite overt in the painting by, by Duncan, um, but using both the appearance of the, of the two, but also um, Celtic design. So she is the slender, fair-skinned Irish Scot, while Tristan is a dark-haired, stockier Breton type. Her gown has an iridescent quality reminiscent of medieval illuminated manuscripts, such as the Lindisfarne Gospels, for example. And directly behind and to her right, the ship is decorated with spiral ornaments, commonly found on Irish and Scottish monuments, as well as in, in illuminated manuscripts. Duncan also uses the spiral to symbolize Isolde's, um, sorry, Duncan uses the spiral to symbolize Isolde's Irish stroke Scottish identity. Um, and it's interesting that the archaeologist Romilly Allen noted that in Wales, Cornwall and the Isle of Man, the spiral ornament, which we see on the left, is very rare. And in order to distinguish Tristan as from Cornish, Welsh or Breton origins, his sleeve is embroidered with complex knotwork design, which is found on Welsh crosses. In later, more overtly Christian works, such as the Adoration of the Magi and St Bride and the National Galleries of Scotland, Duncan applies the same approach. But in these pictures, he's, he has also fused pagan Celticism with, awfully, with obviously Christian references. And perhaps he does this in response to the prejudice of commentators such as Hill Burton. The Magi on the left are from different ethnic backgrounds. Their cloaks, rather confusingly, are decorated with Chinese yin and yang symbols, as well as illustrations from the Book of Kells. Their racial diversity was presumably subject to Duncan's own relatively narrow experience of the wider world. Certainly the figure of Christ and the Virgin are very obviously Western in ethnicity in keeping with the stereotype perpetuated by Italian Renaissance art, which was another important source for Duncan. Perhaps more intriguing are the angels in St. Bride. They carry the young Bridget or bride from Iona to Bethlehem. And they not only wear costumes that combine Christian imagery and Celtic design, but they also resemble West Coast Celts with their reddish hair, fair skin, and pale green eyes. In fact, the angels got almost kind of greenish hazel colored eyes. Duncan based this painting on a short story by Fiona MacLeod, which tells the tale of Muum Krios, the, the foster mother of Christ. So it has a um, kind of a, a, a specific source. Now it's important to underline that Duncan abhorred the notion of racial isolation because, it, because some of these images might be giving this kind of impression. 
And while the 19th century trend for creating racial taxonomies led in time to the belief in an Aryan master race, Duncan was strongly opposed to such notions. In 1934, he painted The Challenge on the left, an extraordinary image that draws on Egyptian art and classical mythology, and which was popularly known as the Blonde Beast. By 1939, it had evolved into a larger, overtly anti-Nazi image, which he renamed Force and Reason. And in both images, the naked Oedipus encounters the powerful and malevolent force of the Sphinx, half human, half beast, whose symbolism is, for once, overtly political. So in conclusion, I hope I've thrown a slightly different light on Duncan's work uh, than before by discussing it in the context of these 19th century debates around race, race and nationhood. And although Duncan's main concern was to create a modern style of painting that drew its inspiration from Celtic art and folklore, he was also concerned to express the multifaceted nature of Celtic identity. Not only was he inspired by the shifting and overlapping narratives of the Celtic myths, he was also fully aware of the historical struggle that had taken place between different tribes, races and creeds before Scotland became a nation in its own right. This is a major theme of his revivalist works, which, I hope I've demonstrated, were underpinned by profound belief in Scotland's identity as part of a universal Celtic family. Thank you.